space coconut. Okay, we're going to try something new today. While I was writing up the main hag guide, I created this section and I was really, really excited to talk about it because it's one of my favorite things to do with the hag. This is mostly for palette loops, but this can also work with some vaults as well. Although I don't think I've ever really gotten it to work on a vault the same way that it works with a palette. Before I get into this, I want to encourage you to sub and hit the bell if you enjoy these types of videos. Like and share them on social media if you think others would enjoy them as well. I want to do this full time, I'm sure you know that by now, and that can only happen if more people know about the channel. Feel free to follow me on Twitter also. I sometimes post the thumbnail or a highlight clip from the next day's video when I finish it so you can get a sneak peek on there. With that out of the way, let's talk about flanking. When you set up a trap, what does it represent to you? It probably is simply a trap that you can teleport if a survivor triggers it, right? Well, I'd like you to try thinking about it this way. When you set a trap, imagine it as the place that you'll be standing at some point during the match. If you think about it this way, then you can imagine that there are multiple copies of you throughout the map wherever you set up a trap. You basically become the Ultron of the fog. Uh, the vibranium's getting away. And you're not going anywhere. Of course not. I'm already there. You'll catch on. But first, you might need to catch Dr. Banner. With this in mind, let's find out what flanking is. I like Wikipedia's description of flanking because it sounds fancy. In military tactics, a flanking maneuver is a movement of an armed force around a flank or side to achieve an advantageous position over an enemy. Flanking is useful because a force's offensive power is concentrated in its front. Therefore, to circumvent a force's front and attack a flank is to concentrate offense in the area where the enemy is least able to concentrate its defense. While you're chasing a survivor, they're often focused on where you are with a secondary thought as to where they're going. Their defense is focused on your attack. And I think you know where I'm going with this, so let's put it together. You've chased a survivor to an untrapped loop and they've dropped the pallet. You drop a trap, some survivors will continue the loop and trigger the trap assuming that you're going to teleport to it and change direction accordingly. To them, you physically exist where the trap is and the path around the loop is clear. While they're busy focusing on the phantasm, you can move around the loop and catch them before they realize what happened. This isn't the only way this scenario can play out though. Let's say the survivor keeps an eye on you and sees that you're not teleporting. They then change direction towards the phantasm. If you time it right, you can teleport at the same moment they meet the phantasm and body block them as well as score a hit. This works because the phantasm faces the survivor as they move, so you don't have to worry about the direction you're facing or turning when you teleport. With these two scenarios, you are effectively in two places at once on both sides of a survivor. And with some quick thinking, you can make easy, safe loops very unsafe for survivors. The most important part of this tactic is the split second decision making and being able to read what a survivor is going to do when they trigger the trap on top of having your internal timer tuned to how long the phantasm will last with the add-ons you're using. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't but it feels very good to execute this tactic flawlessly because you know you outplayed the survivor hard when it works. If you happen to do this early in a match, the survivor will remember what you did earlier and expect you to do the same again. You're basically playing rock, paper, scissors now. If you guess correctly, then you'll be able to score another hit on the survivor by doing the opposite of what you did before, and they will never know what to do against you after that. If a survivor ends up triggering a trap, but not running or vaulting, you're going to want to decide when to teleport. But avoid teleporting right away. They're waiting for you to teleport so they can vault away or waiting for the phantasm duration to end so they can run. But if you wait before teleporting, you are the one dictating when they vault and you can prepare yourself accordingly. 
The most important thing in this situation is your trap placement. You have no time to move when you teleport in this situation, so your phantasm needs to be within striking range of the survivor. If your placement is good, you should be able to teleport and immediately swing. If they vault when you teleport, you could also score a grab, and you can hobble your merry way to a hook. This same thought process can be applied to vaults, but it's very different since you shouldn't chase a survivor through a vault if you can help it. This has only happened twice recently, but is a good example of flanking with a vault. In the first example, I was chasing another survivor near the shack when Nia triggered the trap inside the shack and vaulted through the window. I was close enough to engage her, so I did. She saw me approach and vaulted back through the window into the shack. Because this happened so quickly and I saw her go back inside, I was able to use the phantasm and teleport back inside the shack where she was headed and hit her as she tried to escape through the window a third time. The second was while I chased a Dwight towards the shack. Another survivor had triggered a trap and the phantasm tracked that survivor. As Dwight approached the window, I saw that I could teleport if he committed to the vault, which he did. The problem here is that the phantasm was tracking the other survivor, so immediately after the teleport, I had to turn to score a hit on the Dwight. Both of these situations were not planned originally, but if you can think ahead fast enough and know or see what the survivors are going to do before they do it, you can be in two places at once and create a no-win scenario with the hag. The three eggshell add-ons that extend the phantasm duration can help you learn these tactics by giving you more time to make decisions while the phantasm is active. The phantasm's base duration is 5.5 seconds. The powdered eggshell extends this to 6.6 .6 seconds, the half eggshell extends it to 7.7, .7, and the crack turtle egg extends it to 8.8 .8 seconds. I know those extra seconds don't sound like a lot, but in the middle of a chase or a mind game, they can create quite a bit of chaos if you set it up and capitalize on it. I hope you enjoyed this killer lesson. If you see something happen in a match or have a question about a specific tactic, let me know in the comments by including a timestamp and I'll see if I can turn it into this type of video. This way I can cover general and killer specific tactics as well as tactics against specific survivor perks. One recent one I think you guys would be interested in is uh, how to deal with head-on if survivors are kind of trolling you with it. Uh, yeah, there's an interesting thing you can do with that, which will be in the next killer lesson, although I don't know when that will be. I appreciate the discussions on the NoEd video yesterday. I'm going to go through the comments and I think we'll uh, f do a follow-up video on that. I think it'd be kind of fun to try it. We'll see how that goes. So I'm going to go ahead and work on that. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. In the meantime, I'll see you in the fog. All right, now for the race. I guess we can just let her die. Yeah. And I thought one of them was called Coconut.
before they switched it out last second. Oh well, too bad. 